Father, we come to you again on this Lord's Day to just once again worship you. We, again, thank you for the sunshine. We thank you for those that are here and listening online. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with each and every one of them, comfort them. Pray for those Christians around the world that are being persecuted, and those that are living in places where it's difficult to be a Christian. That Lord, you be with them and just uh, comfort them, guide them, and uh, just give them the encouragement to, to keep going and stay strong. And Father, even for Christians here in America, as we're starting to, this nation is just getting farther and farther away from you and, and just pulling towards Satan each and every day. And for, for the Christians here as well, especially those that are truly trying to stand for you and especially your word in the King James Bible, that Lord, <clears throat> you'll, you'll protect them and guide them, put your hedge around them. And, and that, Father, we, we want to pray for those godly men that are making that stand for the King James Bible, that, that, that that's part of your famine that this, this world is seeing, that the people as a whole do not even want to hear the word, and they don't want the true word, that, you know, where they're not hearing the word if they're not having a King James Bible there. And so there's that feast of that, that, that famine that's coming to the world as people keep rejecting your word and they want to mock the, the King James Bible. And so, Father, just as we saw this morning how Jesus was mocked on the cross, going to the cross and so forth, that, you know, people do the same thing with your true word in the King James Bible. But one day, they, they'll, they, when they stand before you, they'll, they'll realize that they were really mocking you when they were mocking the King James Bible. And so, Father, we, we understand that uh, the miracles that you placed inside it, that it's definitely your inspired word, that, that uh, you're fingerprints, your, your hand prints are uh, just all over it, that, um, you know, your handwriting, you know, I preached on that before, the handwriting, your handwriting's all over it. So, Father, as we continue our study in, the, in, in Revelation, I just pray that you'll give me the words that need to be spoken and the understanding so that I may be able to teach the, the, the truth to these people, because as we get closer and closer to the time that we're about ready to be studying, and we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we uh, saw in verse 8, this will, well, this will be Revelation part 9. So we're on Revelation part 9. And we saw last week in Revelation chapter 1 verse 8 how Jesus is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. And, you know, which is, which was, and which is to come. And I said that, you know, those are the same phrases that... God the Father was and so forth, and how, you know, that shows that Jesus is God, you know, and, and you know, remember Jesus said in John uh, that him, you know, he said, I am the Father of one. So, you know, we see that here, that, that uh, you know, Jesus, and I told you those were good verses, I showed you some in Isaiah and so forth about how to witness to Jehovah's Witnesses, using them, you know, that, they, that showing them that Jesus is the Jehovah of the Old Testament. So, you know, when they try to say that Jesus created, you know, show them that no, that Jesus is Jehovah. But we're going to pick it up here now in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So John next says that he is the brother of all fellow believers. You know, he tells everybody, I'm your brother. You know, remember, you know, if, if people are truly saved, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And, you know, sometimes people will call us, you know, brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. And I'm not saying you have to necessarily always do that. But understand that we are brothers and sisters. You know, if we're truly saved, we're all, you know, brothers and sisters. You know, even more so than if you have real brothers and sisters, and if they're not saved or whatever, then you know, the, the people that are saved, you know, are, are your true brothers and sisters. But, you know, we need to understand that, that uh, you know, as brothers and sisters, you know, we all suffer together. So, that you know, people in these other nations, doesn't matter what they where they are, you know, Africa, Asia, and Europe, wherever, North, South America, Australia or something, doesn't matter, that... Wherever they may be, then, um, you know, when they're suffering, then we should be suffering with them. You know, Jesus tells about that, you know, pray for Christians in bonds. We're told that and so forth. So, 
you know, he's telling you this here. So John said, just like many in his day that, that, that were suffering tribulation for believing in Jesus, as well as many who would come later and read his book, including those who will endure the seven-year tribulation, that he was also enduring tribulation. You know, G John, it's been said that he had, you know, whether this is true or not, but according to history, he had, you know, they, they had tried to kill him too, that the Roman emperor tried to kill him too, just like all the other apostles had already been martyred. And they tried to throw him into a pot of boiling, um, I don't remember if it was water or oil, I think it was oil or something like that. And they tried to boil him alive. Well, he, God, uh, you know, just like with uh, Daniel and, the, you know, they were in the, the three, Daniel's three friends there, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they all got thrown in this fire and they came out and their clothes did not even smell like smoke or anything. You know, you try to tell me doing that, you go anywhere just near anywhere, you roast some marshmallows or something near fire, your clothes are going to smell, let alone be inside it. And so, you know, it's the same thing with this. Supposedly, John came out of this, didn't have anything on him. He was miraculously, you know, prevented from, from uh, any harm. But then now he was even on this island, on Patmos here, just because, you know, basically he'd been condemned to this island because of, uh, you know, his stand for Jesus. So, you know, he had been during, you know, in persecution and so forth as well. So, you know, he understood, you know, as a brother in, in, in Christ, and he understood what these people were going through. And, you know, that's what it should be. We should understand that, you know, pray for these people that, okay, maybe we don't have to go through some of this stuff, but, one day is going to come here and, you know, he's telling me, look, I understand because I've gone through this stuff myself. So, but I'm going to be preaching about stuff that's going to be coming up. That's going to make some of this stuff look like child's play. But John said he was a fellow companion to believers in the coming kingdom of Jesus and the patience required to wait for that coming kingdom. You know, he says, you know, I, John, will also be your brother and companion, tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. You know, he's telling you that, you know, as, as the believers, we're all in that kingdom. Now, technically, we're not in the kingdom yet. You know, the kingdom will come during the millennium. But if you're saved, you're going to be there during that time. So in that sense, we're in the kingdom. You know, if you're truly saved, you're already in the kingdom. And that's what, you, you know, John's saying that, look, I'm I get, you know, visions, you know, he's going to see, he's going to get visions of this and stuff, you know, and in God's eyes, you know, that's only a couple of days away, you know, so it was, you know, at that time, so, and for our time, it's, it's hours away, you know, whatever. But, you know, he's saying that, you know, you need to have that patience, when you're dealing, you know, as a Christian, especially when you're going through all this tribulation, you need to have that patience, you know, we're all looking forward to the, or should be, for the coming return of Jesus and that, that millennial kingdom. You know, it's not going to be that far away, but we need to endure the pain, the, the pain, have the patience because until then, right now, things are going to continue to get worse and worse and worse and worse until Jesus does return. And it's not always easy to keep that patience because, you know, it, it, it's very frustrating seeing what's going on in the world. But John tells us, you know, look, I'm in that same you know, boat and, and, you know, we need to keep that, that patience, that, you know, keep that faith in Jesus. But John said he was writing this book from the Isle. Isle just is a poetic way of saying island. You know, remember the King James Bible was written poetically. Make it easier to understand, memorize. But John said, he, you know, I said he was writing writing the, this book. In other words, Revelation. That's, you know, he was writing that from the, from the Isle or Island of Patmos. Now, Patmos is a Greek island in the Aegean Sea. You know, if you know, if you ever look at like, Greece, it's got a whole bunch of islands there off, you know, in the Aegean Sea. And Patmos is, is one of those little islands. Now, many political prisoners of the Roman Caesar were sent to this island. You know, that the French and um, Devil's Island, I think it was, or whatever, but there, there was different ones over the years that, you know, nations had different islands. And they would do that. They would, you know, in one sense, we kind of do that with some of our political prisoners. Now we send them down to Guant Guantanamo Bay there on the island of Cuba. They, they, they would send these people, political, you know, people they were not good for the government. In the government's eyes, they were, you know, enemies or this and that. Or, you know, it's people they just kind of wanted to get rid of if they didn't kill them. 
they would send him there, you know, kind of get him out of the way, you know, so they couldn't start more trouble or something like that. You know, like Napoleon, he got sent off to an island for a while and things like that. Well, that's what this Patmos was for. You know, basically, if you're on Patmos, you know, you were considered a political prisoner. You were, you were, you were not, you know, oh, well, you're here. Hey, you just moved here. You like the, you know, that's a nice island here. I'm glad you, you know, you're not, you didn't really, you didn't go necessarily go to Patmos by choice. But John tells why he was sent to this island. It was not for any crime that he had committed, but rather for his testimony of Jesus Christ and his preaching of the word of God. You know, it tells us right there at the end, it says he was in the isle that was called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So he's telling you why he was sent there. You know, so it's showing you that, you know, again, you don't just go there just because like, ah, oh, that's a good spot to vacation or whatever. That, that uh, you know, he was going there because of his testimony. You know, in his preaching of, of, of the word of God. You know, even in his old age, John never wavered in his faith. You know, people often use that excuse, well, I'm getting old. I mean, even pastors, they're like, well, I've been preaching for 60 years. You know, I'm 80 years old now. I'm going to retire. God never tells, said you could retire. You know, that I understand that there may be some times where if you just physically, you, you can no longer speak or, you know, there's, 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 there's our things, but. There's too many of them, they just, I just want to go out and enjoy life or do whatever. You know, that's not what you're there for. God called you to preach. And so, you know, you're to serve God. I'm not saying you have to stay in the pulpit. You could be doing something else, but that uh, you need to be serving the Lord. You know, God doesn't retire. You don't retire from serving the Lord. And, you know, that's how John was. He's still out there in his, in his old age. And he's still, I mean, that's why I said he was recently just, they tried to kill him in this pot of boiling oil. And that failed, and so that's when they said, well, we can't kill him, so let's just send him off to this island here, get rid of him. So maybe he can't at least be out preaching the word, you know, and so forth. So, you know, he was not just sitting back, you know, in retirement and, and relaxing or whatever. But we, so we clearly see John tells us why he was sent to this island. Now, remember, John was the last surviving apostle, and he wants the people to understand that he knows what it means to suffer tribulation since he himself had, you know, so again, you know, it's, it's, it's like most things. He's not telling you something that he has not done himself. You know, he's not telling you that, that, uh, you know, he's been through this himself. He's gone through his own trials and tribulations. You know, he's seen what happened to Jesus. He's seen, you know, what happened to all the other apostles. You know, he knew that it was only a matter of time. I mean, they, they killed all the other apostles. I'm quite sure he'd heard either supernaturally or whatever about, about the deaths of all these other people. And so, you know, he knew it was only a matter of time. I mean, Christians been persecuted and so forth like that. And, and, um, you know, that's why they started scattering around is because of the, the persecution by the Romans. So, but yeah, he, he was telling you that, you know, excuse me, that he understood what people were going through. So, you know, it wasn't like just talking, well, you don't know anything because you never had to do, you know, John knew what he was talking about. Well, let's look at verse 10. So Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. So John says he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. You know, notice it's a capital, capital S, you know, so he, you know, he, he's, Focused on worshiping, you know, the Lord here. Now, the Lord's Day is Sunday, and John was worshiping God and filled with the Holy Ghost as he was in an in, in intent worship. You know, so, as I said, he was filled with the Spirit because, you know, he was in the Spirit because he, he's, he's uh, you know, was in this intense worshiping. And it was on the Lord's Day. Now, some theologians say that in the Spirit on the Lord's Day refers to John being brought by the Spirit to the seven-year tribulation. But I disagree. He he, uh, he will later, but I do not believe so at this time. You know, I, I mean, we, we see that John will later on, and that happens. And I mean, to me, that seems to be that's about chapter uh, beginning of chapter four, verse one or so. But you know, and then you know he will at this point. But I do not believe that that's what's referring to here. Now, it may be possible that the Holy Ghost was allowing him to see this as in other places in Revelation where John is carried by the spiritual location. But I do not believe this first refers to being transported to the future tribulation. 
It just means God gave the vision to John on the Lord's day or Sunday. Now, John said he heard a great voice behind him as loud as a trumpet. It was definitely not one he could ignore. You know, trumpet is very loud. You know, we cannot ignore such a thing. You know, that, you know, this shows the voice was a commanding voice that was to be obeyed. You know, this is a loud voice. It's not one of those, you know, a whisper or something like that. That You, you hear this voice, you're going to, what was that voice? And, you know, it's no, one of those that you obey. You know, and it's been said, too, that, you know, even like with the rapture, that, you know, there, there's a trumpet gets sounded there. You know, the trumpet is, I mean, the, the rapture is not going to necessarily be a quiet thing either. That, you know, there's a, a trumpet, a loud trumpet being, you know, uh, being sounded and so forth. That, but like I said, there are people try to say that this is not really, you know, the Lord's Day here is referring to, you know, the either the tribulation or, the, or whatever and so forth, that, that it's not really referring to Sunday. But I believe it's referring to Sunday, which shows you that, you know, we should be worshiping on Sunday because, uh, you know, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, you know, not, not, um, you know, people say, well, we should just be on Saturday and so forth. But, you know, like I said, but you can make your own interpretation, but I think it's referring to, um, you know, worship on, su on Sunday. And I believe that, like I said, he was in the spirit in the sense that he was deep into worship. And so, you know, the, the spirit, you know, may have been giving them some um, insights and so forth like that. But, you know, this was uh, an intense worship. But here's this voice, you know, this great voice that it's, it's loud like a trumpet. So we'll look at verse 11, Revelation chapter 1, verse 11, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Now the voice said, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Now we see Jesus just as seen in verse 8, which I read when we first started, for the second time, it says he is the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. You know, Jesus is once again making it clear that he is God and is in control of everything as the first and the last. You know, he, he when you, you're the beginning and you're the end, you control everything. You know, you know what's going to happen and all that kind of stuff. So once again, no one was here before him or will be here after him. Now, Jesus tells John that what he will see to write in a book and then send it to the seven churches which are here, which are in Asia. And Jesus then tells him which of the seven churches he is referring to, since as we saw earlier in the study, there was in reality more than seven churches in Asia at this time. You know, remember, we saw those seven churches are representative of what we believe are the the seven main church, you know, representative, or each one was a, a type of representative of the various churches throughout the church age that, that uh, you know, like right now we're in Laodicea, the compromising church, which is very much what the church is doing today. So it's very, you know, I believe that's kind of what they represent. You know, but there were a lot more than, than these churches here, you know, than the seven. But, you know, Jesus, you know, so he it wasn't like, okay, well, which church am I supposed to send to? Jesus gave them the exact seven. He says, and these are the seven you're going to send it to. So Jesus says the seven churches are Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. You know, these seven churches, as I said, were, were picked personally by Jesus. Now, whether it's true that they're based off of being the type of representative, whatever, there's definitely a reason, you know, if I'm wrong and all that, but there's definitely a reason why those seven churches were picked. You know, as I said, there was other churches he could have picked, but he chose those. And why he just sent them directly to Asia? Why not some churches in, in Europe? You know, like at this time, there would have been some churches in, uh, you know, like Greece and so forth like that. So uh, uh, we know, that you know, there was church in Rome, you know, so there were churches in Europe. But why, you know, why were they, you know, just sent to Asia? We don't, you know, who knows? That's, uh, you know, maybe it has to do with the fact that, Israel's in Asia, and everything has to start 
around Israel, and then remember everything got spread out, you know, to the Samaritans and then to the Gentiles and so forth. So maybe it has some perspective to do with that. I do not really know, but but the book that John wrote that he sent to these seven churches is this book of Revelation that became part of Scripture. You know, so what what he's what he sends to them, you know, he says, what thou seest, write in a book and send it under the seven churches. What he sent was what we have, what we know is revelation. Because what he is going to end up seeing is everything we're going to go through in the whole book of Revelation. And then when he got done, then that's when he would send this book off to these seven churches. So what they were getting sent was basically what we have as, as revelation. I mean, that's my understanding anyway, and I, I think most would agree that, that uh, I mean, it makes sense, you know, writing a book. I mean, he didn't say, you know, only write up to this point and then stop and I'll send it off and then I'm going to show you more stuff. But we also see that he tells him to write, you know, write it in a book. Number one, it's like anything else you can, you know, write it, but, but it says what thou seest. So he's only writing down what he sees, not just... Uh, well, we're going to see later on to like a what you hear and things like that. But, but you know, it's not just, well, I don't know. I, I, I think that, that there might be this or that. No, it's only what you see or hear is what he writes in this book. So it's not his personal opinions. It's not hearsay or whatever. You know, it's only if he didn't physically see it or physically hear it himself, like that voice he heard of Jesus, then, you know, it's not one of those things like, well, I had a guy tell me that he saw a guy that had another guy that, had, you know, it's, it's only what he saw is what got written down in this book. So, you know, John was an eyewitness of the things that, that are going to happen during the, the tribulation of the millennium. Well, look at uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. So here it is. John heard his voice in verse 10 there. And it tells him what we just saw there in verse 11. To write these things down. So, you know, basically by the time he gets done saying all that, he turns around to, to hear that, you know, look, you know, see this voice. Like, who, who talking back here? And where's this coming from? And, you know, so being turned, you know, he, uh, so as I said, John turns to see that voice that spoke to him. And when he turned, he saw seven golden candlesticks. Now we will see in verse 20, how these seven golden candlesticks represent the seven churches that were mentioned in verse 11. Now notice that they are golden since the true church is made up of believers who are indwelt by God and gold represents deity. So therefore the church, which represents God is also golden. You know, remember the true church is, you know, it's always it's been said many times, but it's not a building. You know, we always say, I'm going to church, right? Hey, that's my that's that's the church over there. That's where I go, whatever. That's the building where we have our services and we worship or do whatever. But it's um, you know, the church is made up of all true believers. Now, there's many people that are that go to a church building that are not members of the church. They might be members of that physical church, like such and such Baptist church or whatever church it is. But they're not true born again believers, so they're not true members of the church. You know that the true church is the body of Christ of all true believers, no matter what denomination you're in, or so forth, and or non-denominational, or whatever. That um, you know that that's the church. And so, if you're a true believer, then you're indwelt with the Holy Ghost, and you have Jesus in you, and so now you have God living within you. So now you have deity in there, which, you know, deity is represented by gold. So therefore the church, we should be golden too, because we should be representing Jesus as that church. You know, remember I've said before, we're supposed to shine that light as the moon, just the way, you know, that, that re reflects the light from the sun, which Jesus is the sun, you know, represents the sun. Or the sun represents him, rather. Now, lamp stands are a fitting description for the church. A lampstand gives light, just as Jesus said we as Christians were to be the light of the world in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. Let's take a look at that first. You know, and I just recently preached on, you know, how God is light. I preached on, you know, Jesus is the light of the world before and so forth. And 
you know, but I've said that, you know, we as Christians, because we have God living within us, we need to reflect some of that light, shine forth some of that light. You know, we're to be a lighthouse on the, on the hill, and we're going to look at here. And so, um, you know, we're to shine forth brightly that light, go out and tell people about Jesus. They should see Jesus in us and so forth. So look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Now, since Christians are the church, then the church should be shining forth brightly. Now, just as Christians cannot produce their own light, but rather only shine forth the light of Jesus, the candlestick can only shine forth the light that is produced by the oil in it, but cannot produce its own. And I mean, in other words, a candlestick, you just place a candlestick there, it doesn't do anything, unless you put a candle in it, or, you know, you have some uh, a, a lamp or something that, you know, if you don't you know, put the oil in there first and then, you know, have a wick or something to light it, you know, the, the, just the object itself cannot produce the light. It has to have, you know, something, you know, with it. Well, that's represented like the church. You know, we have to have God within us. You know, you have many churches out there, but they, they were godless churches, so they have no light. You know, it's just because you're a church doesn't make you have, you know, shine forth light. You have to have, you know, God in it. Now, a candlestick is only limited to its brightness by the amount of oil it gets. And the same applies to the church. Its brilliance is only limited by how much of the light of Jesus we choose to reflect and shine forth to the world. You know, a, a, a Christian or a church, you can go back to Revelation then a, a Christian or a church is only as bright as we allow that light to shine forth. If we want to go out there, I mean, again, if you're using the King James Bible, which is God's inspired holy word, rather than one of these corrupt counterfeit Bibles, you're going to shine forth a lot, lot brighter because you have the true word of God. You know, if you have a counterfeit one, you don't even have the word, a true word of God. So you're not, you know, you're not going to be feasting on, you know, as, as much. I'm not saying somebody cannot get saved, but they're not going to have that. They're not going to have that growth. They're not going to have that, uh, see the same as somebody that's, that's strong in the King James Bible. And, you know, as I said, there's so many churches nowadays are, are the compromising churches. And so, you know, they might be Christians, but there's so many of them that say, well, I'm saved, but. As long as I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. I don't really worry about it. I can still kind of live in the world. And that's how most Christians are. And so there's just not a lot of light being shine, shown forth because we're not allowing more oil to be put into us or more light from Jesus. And, it's, you know, so and it, so now it's applied to us as a whole, you know, individually, but, you know, the church as a whole, it, the church is only limited by, you know, what we limited on our own. You know, if we allow Jesus to come more into us, then we'll have more light. <laughs> Excuse me. And so, you know, that that's, that's the thing right now. There's so many people in the church that are turning away, you know, they're backsliding or so forth like that. And that's why, like, this nation and the church as a whole is having so many problems. If we would turn to the Lord and let that light shine forth, you know, go out and witness for people, tell people about Jesus and things like that, then... You know, this world and, and, you know, we would shine brighter and things would, you know, this world would be a different place. But we're only limited by, as I said, by what we are preventing ourselves from, you know, keeping Jesus from, you know, coming in and shining forth that light that's, that's found within us. You know, sin is what blocks that light. Let's take a look at Revelation chapter 1 verse 13. So Revelation chapter 1 verse 13. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girded about the paps with a golden girdle. So John said, in the middle of the seven candlesticks was one like unto the Son of Man. Now John saw Jesus in the middle of these seven candlesticks, not an angel or other spiritual being. He said, like the Son of Man, because he looked like Jesus, but here Jesus has his full glory like he did on the Mount of Transfiguration. So he appeared like he did when he walked off, walked the earth, but not exactly the same as he now once again showed his full deity to be seen by all. 
You know, so that's that's why he says, you know, light under the Son of Man, because, you know, what he was used to, yes, he had seen him on the Mount of Transfiguration, but, you know, he saw him more as, you know, like the man, where now he's seeing him in his full glory as God that's shining forth. And so, you know, that's, that's why he said, but, he, you know, this is not referring to an angel or, or some other type of spiritual being. Or this is, you know, this is really Jesus. I mean, Jesus said in, um, you know, verse 11 there that he was the Alpha and Omega and so forth. You know, obviously that's not referring to an angel. You know, that's referring to God. And we saw that in verse 8 where Jesus had those titles and so forth. You know, not like that, but um, Jesus, um, oh, I lost my train of thought, but, but, he, but I mean, it, it, it's clearly, you know, referring to, to uh, Jesus. You know, it's not, not somebody else or whatever that, that um, is being talked about here. You know, plus, Jesus was referred to as the Son of Man. You know, the angels are not referred to as Son of Man. They're referred to as son, Sons of God. So, you know, that, this was a title that was, that was uh, for Jesus. You know, Daniel also referred to Jesus as like the Son of Man. Look at Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. So turn to Daniel chapter 7, and verse 13. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. I saw in the night, it's after Ezekiel there. Yeah. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Now the ancient of days, that, that's referring to God the Father. People say that's Jesus, but if you look, it cannot be Jesus because the Son of Man is coming to him, which the Son of Man is Jesus. So, you know, it has to be God the Father. But Now remember, seven means perfection just as his church is perfect. The actual church buildings are full of sinners, but in God's eyes, we, we have all been washed in the blood of Jesus and have been made perfect. Now, Jesus is in the middle because he said he would be in the midst of where two or three were gathered in his name. You know, whenever at least two Christians gather to worship him, then he is in the middle of them. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. So Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. I thought what I was going to say earlier, too, is also Jesus. We know that this verse is talking about Jesus as well because you know, Jesus is the one that founded the church. You know, we, we've seen, I've heard that said where people say that the church gave birth to Jesus. No, the church, Jesus gave birth to the church. You know, that, that Jesus is the one that founded the church. So, you know, this would, wouldn't apply to an angel. We were talking about the candlesticks and he's in the middle of the candlesticks. Well, we know that Jesus said that he was in the middle of believers here. So look, we're going to see that here in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. You know, so when two or three are gathered together, then Jesus is in the middle there. You know, Jesus is here today, and right here in this, this sermon, this church service. That, uh, you know, Jesus is there. And that's what, you know, so Jesus is the one in the middle of the candlesticks or churches, since he is the head of the church. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. I'm going to finish up this little section here and then we'll stop. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. We've got a couple more verses to get through. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So we see that Christ is the head of the church. You know, and then we also saw that the husband is the head of the wife, but that's for another uh, sermon, but you know, Christ is the head of the church. You know, he's the one, he's the founder of the church. 
But Jesus founded the church, and the church belongs to him. Jesus was clothed with a garment down to, his, down to the foot, and around his breast or chest was a golden girdle. Remember I said before that paps refers specifically to uh, the nipple parts of the breast. But, um, you know, basically it's showing you it's around, you know, around the breast. Now the garment to his feet was typical of that worn by the Israelite high priest. And Jesus is our high priest and in heaven. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1. So Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. So Jesus is our high priest. You know, that, that, uh, you know, he's the leader of the church. Now some theologians say the garden also shows Jesus as judge. Now, girdle refers to a belt or sash that was worn usually only by those in power and authority. They wore loose-fitting clothes, and this would bind them for easier use. And Jesus said all power was given to him. We're going to close with this, but go to uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. So Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. But, you know, they would have these, these long, loose garments on, and they would tie this, this belt basically around their, you know, um, their waist, you know, to, to try to, you know, that would help tighten it up, kind of like, you know, we'll wear pants, so it made it a little easier for them to, you know, to get around, but that was usually done by, you know, people in high authority and so forth, and so, you know, it is possible, like some people say, that the garment is also showing Jesus as judge, because we know he is certainly going to be the judge coming, you know, he's not necessarily directly, you know, that it, that's going to come later on, you know, he didn't come in his first calling to be, you know, first coming to be the judge, but rather be the Savior. Look at Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. You know, so Jesus is, he's in control of everything, you know. Um, all power is given to Jesus. And, and so, you know, think about that. Even though we see how things are going bad in the world today, just remember that Satan is on that leash. He can still only do what Jesus allows him to. And that Jesus is fully in control. You know, he does allow him to do certain things because of man's sin. But ultimately, Jesus will be victorious, as we'll see at the end of the book here, that uh, Jesus will triumph and so forth. So, you know, as frustrating as it gets, we do need to understand that Jesus is still fully in control. And Satan one day will be defeated and cast into the lake of fire. And as I said a while ago, you know, perhaps it refers to the nipples. So once again, we see this girdle was golden since gold represents deity and Jesus is God. So, you know, again, it's, it, it, there's a reason why. Pay attention to these. That we're going to be stopping here. But just pay attention to these things that, uh, you know, remember I said the colors and the numbers and all these things have meanings. That, you know, you look at this and like, well, okay, he has this, this uh, girdle around and it's golden. Well, I was it golden because, you know, it's being worn by God. So, you know, Jesus is God. And, you know, just pay attention, but you know, like I said, but it kind of represents, you know, these things where he had, uh, you know, this would be used to probably tie off and so forth like that. But we're going to continue looking at some of the description about Jesus. We'll look at it next week. A couple of verses are going to be described. I mean, we saw the clothes he wore here, and then we're going to look at it. Look at, we'll go next week. We'll start on Revelation chapter 1, verse 14. We'll be in verse 14, and we'll pick it up there. But the... Um, We'll see a little bit more of the description here, here as well. Well, let's, let's uh, have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you again for this time to once again to study your word and worship you, Lord. And Father, we again thank you that you do live within us and, and that um, we do pray that we all might shine forth righteously to you, Lord, that, that uh, others might see Jesus in us. And that we know we do... Pray, Lord, that you'll keep us, you know, comforted and knowing that Jesus is all power has been given to him and that he's fully in control. Of, even though it seems like Satan's in control of the world right now, we know that Jesus is only allowing him 
a lot of leeway right now to, to do certain things as, as to punish man for our sins, including my own and everybody else's, that we're all guilty of it. And that, um, but yet one day Jesus will be triumphant and he'll set up his, his millennial thousand year kingdom. And so Father, we do look for that second coming, even so come Lord Jesus and pray Lord that today might be that day and the, the sooner the better. But we do pray Lord that until then, that we might be faithful to you and, and be great witnesses and go out there and shine forth that light and tell others about Jesus so that they too might be saved and, and escape the tribulation. So, Father, as we, again, we, we get ready to depart. We pray that for safety for each and every one, those who are here and listening online, that they'll have a great week and, and uh, be protected. And, and that uh, you may bless each and every one and allow for a safe return on Wednesday. And we just pray that you give us a blessed week. And again, thank you for the sunshine. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.